In this video, I will cover wave particle duality, looking at the double slit experiment, de Broglie's hypothesis, and then finishing with the context of the wave function and what that is. So we can imagine, first of all, water waves on the left-hand side here, planar water waves approaching some kind of barrier or screen that has two holes in it or two slits. And what happens is that when the water waves approach those two gaps in this barrier, then we get diffraction. And effectively, we have two sources of water waves being emanated from those two slits. And we end up with a constructive and destructive interference based on whether the troughs coincide with each other or whether the peaks coincide with each other. And that's what we see here on the right hand side. We would notice constructive interference of peaks here and then we'd have a destructive interference of the troughs. And that's why we end up with this interference pattern for water waves. Now, the same is noticed uh, with light. If we were to shine laser light into some kind of similar setup where we have a screen with two slits, then we end up again with effectively having two sources of light here and they are diffracting, and that allows scope for this interference to occur again, where we have constructive interference, such as shown with one of these bright bands here, and then destructive interference corresponding to these dips in this pattern on the optical screen. So water behaves like waves, as we know, and light behaves like waves. But what about electrons? Well, if we were to imagine classically what would happen, We'd have electrons approaching this kind of obstacle with two gaps or two slits. And then we might imagine by classical physics that we'd end up with two bands of detected electrons on the screen on the right hand side here. However, what is it that we do see experimentally? Well, let's imagine again we've got some electron gun firing electrons in towards this obstacle, this screen with two slits. What we observe is the following. These dots denote particular detections of single electrons. And we see that over time, we still get these kinds of interference patterns occurring. We get this kind of constructive interference with, this, with these dark bands and the destructive interference where we hardly detect any electrons in these kind of white areas where there are hardly any detections. So taking another look at that, we've got an electron gun coming in, firing electrons at this screen with two slits, this double slit experiment, and we end up with this interference pattern for electrons. So they are behaving just like the water waves, just like the light waves were with that diffraction effect and then with the interference being seen on some screen to the right hand side of the experiment. So this is another visualization where we've got, uh, it could either be electrons or indeed uh, laser light, and they approach two slits. We end up with two effective sources of waveforms which constructively and destructively interfere to result in the pattern on the right hand side. So here again, I'm depicting the result for electron, uh, electrons being detected and forming this kind of band-like um, interference pattern. Now, what is really remarkable is if that we put the electrons through just one at a time and wait before putting another electron through. So just one and then wait, put another one through and wait. Then what we get on that detection screen on the right hand side, first of all, for the case of 11 electrons shown at the top there, 200 electron hits and so on. Then by the time of 140,000 electrons being detected, we still get these interference patterns here. These are bright bands and the dark bands. And so it's as if each individual electron is somehow going through both slits and interfering with itself to be able to generate this kind of interference pattern. And yet notably when it's detected, it is still detected at a single fixed position. So we need to look into what is going on here. Well, first of all, before these experiments were done, Back in 1924, in his PhD thesis, Louis de Broglie, a French physicist, postulated that electrons behave like waves. And in fact, that all matter has wave-like properties. Just like photons, previously thought to be just waves, have been shown to be particles or photons, so de Broglie did the opposite and considered electrons, uh, conventionally regarded as particles, as now also behaving like waves. 
and so he put forward the following hypothesis. He said that the wavelength of a particle of mass m and velocity v, that the wavelength is given by Planck's constant divided by the mass times velocity, in other words, divided by the momentum. And this is an example of wave-particle duality. And he actually got the Nobel Prize for this in 1929. Why was that? Well, in 1927, so a few years after de Broglie's hypothesis, this was experimentally shown to be the case by Sir George Paget Thompson, who in fact was the son of J.J. Thompson, the person who discovered the electron. So experimentally, electron interference patterns were seen by George Paget Thompson, for which he received a Nobel Prize in 1937, shared with C.J. Davison, who also independently, experimentally showed the same thing. So de Broglie's hypothesis was just a hypothesis. It was then demonstrated experimentally in 1927. Louis de Broglie got the Nobel Prize in 1929. So let's have a look at that de Broglie's hypothesis and see if we can get some kind of sense out of it. So there it is again, lambda is equal to h over p. So the wavelength of a particle is given by Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the particle. So we can check its reasonableness just by looking at some well-known relationships here. Here's Einstein's energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. And here is the expression for photons. Energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. So let's see if we can manipulate these expressions. First of all, taking HF and substituting that on the left-hand side here, we have HF is equal to mc squared. And now we know, of course, that c is equal to frequency times wavelength. The velocity is frequency times wavelength. So we can substitute for frequency over here by using c divided by lambda. So that's what I'm doing here. h c divided by lambda is equal to mc squared. Then furthermore, we can think, well, okay, this mc squared, we could think of that as a mass times a velocity times a velocity. So we can take first just one of the just the mass times one of the velocities, and that will give us p. So now we've got hc over lambda is equal to p, mass times velocity, times the remaining uh, velocity c. And look at what we've got. We've got exactly de Broglie's relationship. p is equal to h over lambda, or indeed, lambda is equal to h over p. So here we are again with that double slit experiment where we've got an electron gun firing electrons, even just one by one, through the double slit, and they somehow interfere with each other to result in this interference pattern. And again, we just get a definite single detection of an electron, just as a particle detection, if you like, even though there has been wave-like phenomena going on throughout this experiment in order to even get that interference pattern on the right-hand side on the screen here. So let's take a look at a simulation of a wave packet, which is, if you like, analogous to this electron and being viewed now as a wave. What is happening as that electron passes through those two slits? Let's take a look. There's the electron as a wave packet approaching the double slit. We see that part of it gets reflected off to the left and part of it carries on towards the right. And we notice we get that kind of diffraction result at the two slits there. And then we've got effectively two sources which can interfere with each other, just like the water waves, just like the light waves, so that we get an interference pattern on the right-hand side. Let's take another look with a different kind of animation here. Again, there's the electron approaching the double slit. Because it's like a waveform, it can now pass through both slits. Part of it gets reflected, part of it goes off towards the right-hand side as two separate sources which can now interfere with each other and we're able to detect an interference pattern on the right-hand side. So let's take a look at what this wave function might be. So I've drawn an arbitrary function here, and I'm calling the wave function psi of x, as indeed is done in quantum mechanics. And so it's representing some amplitude. Normally it's a complex number, but we'll just deal with a real number here. Some amplitude as a function of spatial coordinate x. We'll just consider it in 1D. And so what we're saying is that that wave function for the electron actually passes through both slits, as we've just seen in those simulations. So it has many possible positions where it could be found, because it's very important to note that if we actually measured 
if we made a detection of the electron, we would only get a very definite position for where it is. We wouldn't see it as a waveform, we'd see it as a particular point particle where we detect it. But whilst it's going through those slits, and if we're not measuring it, then there are many possible positions or locations where it could be found. And so this wave function is related to the probability of finding the particle or the electron at a particular position x. So if it was like this arbitrary waveform here, um, it would be like saying it's got a reduced probability of being detected in this location and a higher probability of being detected at that peak location there. So what is this exactly? Effectively, this wave function is a sum of position states. In other words, because it could be found in many different locations with different probabilities, we're saying that actually the wave function is composed of what are known as delta functions, which are very narrow functions showing particular position locations. And we can use these delta functions to build that wave function. So I'm going to show that now. There's the wave function. Now I'm adding together these spike-like functions. You can see them here. I'm just showing them in series here just to illustrate. Each one of these is a delta function that is shifted to a particular x coordinate, which I'm calling x prime, to access different particular choices of x along that axis. And so that means the wave function psi of x is equal to a summation or an integral of many possible positions, which I'm representing these position states as delta functions, delta x, with a particular location x prime. So delta x shifted to position x prime is written as delta x minus x prime. So that's what this integral equation is saying. Here are these position states, each one of those little spike functions that we saw earlier, um, and we're adding them all together. But notice also, we have an amplitude in front of each one of those position states. And that amplitude is none other than the wave function evaluated at the position of each one of those delta functions. So this psi of x prime is just an amplitude, or if you like, a scaling factor for each of these positions. And then we add them all up, and that indeed gives us the original wave function, which is just saying that wave function is composed of a sum of virtually infinitely many position states. So again, here we go. We're saying the electron passes through both slits. It has many possible positions. And that wave function relates to the probability of finding the electron at a particular position x. And as I've just said, that wave function is therefore a sum of many possible positions. So that's the equation we just looked at on the previous slide. Here I'm showing a wave packet, a Gaussian wave packet, changing with time. But we're only dealing with um, static functions that are not changing with time. So I should indeed fix that function as I'm doing there. So that would be more like the kind of function that we're showing with this integral equation, where it's made up of lots of different particular positions. Now, as mentioned, when we measure where that particle is exactly, we get what's called wave function collapse, where we end up with just one single delta function only. And the, the one that we pick up is related to this, which is being treated as a probability amplitude. And we'll see that in the next slide as to what the probability is. So basically, this is what the wave function looks like. When we measure it, it collapses to just one fixed position, if you like, one single delta function at a particular location, x prime. So what is the probability of detecting it? So it's basically psi star times psi. In other words, the complex conjugate of that wave function times itself. And that gives us this intensity, which is equal to the probability of finding, it's a probability density function actually, of finding the particle at a particular position x. And so here on this animation is another example of a wave particle, a wave-like particle, in a box where there's actually a, a kind of obstacle in the middle here. And you can see that there's a probability of finding that particle either side of that barrier. So I hope this video has given you some insight into wave particle duality and into what that wave function is in terms of a superposition of states and how we can relate that to the probability of finding a particle at a particular position x. Thanks for listening.